Hello everybody, Michael Fudge here again, and in this video I'm going to demonstrate another end-to-end -end example. In the end-to-end -end example series, we try to solve real-world problems in our code. I will demonstrate the approach to the problem and devise a plan and then execute that plan in Python. It's designed to give you a complete picture of how to take your informational problems that you may have and code up a working solution. This end-to-end -end example is based on the content of Lesson 4, which covers conditionals. Conditionals are things like the if statement, if else statement, and the try except statements. I'm going to program organically, which means I'm probably going to make mistakes. I'm going to learn from them. I'm going to revise my code and continue programming. You'll see bugs. You'll see errors. You'll see it all, just like it happens in real life. There's very little editing, and that's by design. For this example, I'll code up in Jupyter Notebook. You can already see I have the problem on the screen before you. You're welcome to code right along with me, but the source code for what you'll see is available on GitHub here. And if you're a student taking my course, you already have this code on your computer. So let's get started. In this example here, we've been tasked by the country of Fudgevonia to write a program that determines the amount of taxes based on dependents. So for example, if you have zero dependents, then your tax rate is 30%. So if I made $1,000, then my tax rate would be 30% of that $1,000 or $300. If you have one dependent, it's 25%, two dependents, 18, and three or more dependents is 10%. Where this problem is different than the previous problem that we did involving taxes, the output of your program is going to vary depending on the number of dependents. Whether you have zero, one, two, or three dependents, the, the values are going to change. So let's think about how we're going to write this program. It says write a program to prompt for the number of dependents, and then how much you make annually, and then it should calculate your tax rate and tax bill. Format the numbers properly, handle bad input as usual. So once again, let's start by thinking of a plan. So my plan is first going to be to obviously uh, input number of dependents as an as an integer, right? 0, 1, 2, or 3. 0, 1, 2, or 3. Now, if you enter 7 or 9, that still works because it says 3 or more. If you enter a negative number, I, I don't know what I should do about that. Maybe I should just assume that it's 0. But if you enter a letter like X or Y, it's not going to work. Let's go through a quick example of that. So if I say dependents and I say input, if I do this, we have, we've all learned at this point that when you do this, the type of the variable is not an int, it's, it's a stir. So we want to put you know, the int function around it to say, get this input, which is a, of type stir, and then please convert it to an int and then store it in the variables, which this now does what we want, right? I run that, and then I get type dependence, and it says int, beautiful. But one of the problems is that when I run this and type in two like this, or just any other text, I am going to get an error, a value error. And so one of the things that we'll do at the end of the program, once we get it working the way we want, we'll rewrite it to handle that inputs. All right, with that out of the way, let's continue to think through our program logic. So we'll input the number of dependents, we'll input the annual income, and then we need to make some decisions. So we use the if logic here. If the dependence is equal to zero, then tax rate should be 30%. Else if dependence is equal to, then tax rate 0.25. One of the things you might be wondering is why not just make these a series of ifs, like if dependence equal to zero, tax rate, and then if dependence equals to one, tax rate. Well, when you use multiple ifs like this, it's actually making two decisions here. When you use the else if logic, it's going to test each decision until one of them is true, and then it's going to stop checking for decisions. So for example, if I go like this, it's going to test this, and then it's either true or it's not, and if it's true, it does this. But then regardless, it's going to test this one, which is not going to be true because we already checked that the dependence is equal to zero, and it was. So it's going to continue to test this logic whether it needs to or not. When you use the else if structure, what happens is that as soon as this gets tested, if that's true, then this happens, then it doesn't do any of the other else ifs. It can just skip them. So it's a little more efficient than a series of ifs. 
And also you can introduce um, a bug that you might not want by using a series of is if you happen to have logic that can fall into more than one case. But let's continue with our thinking here. Uh, else if dependence is equal to equal to two, then to tax rate, and I spelled it wrong here, right? Tax rate should be 18%. I'm not writing any code at this point, folks. I'm just really kind of thinking it through, right? So uh, then I'm going to throw in an else clause that says else, and this is the assumption that um, anything more than two, you know, so three, four, five, six, right? Anything else, the tax rate should be 10%. All right. Now this doesn't handle the error if they type in a negative tax rate or something like that, but we'll, we'll deal with those things later. What I like to do is I like to get a program that works first, then start to deal with all the crazy edge cases of how to deal with the strange inputs. Okay, so what happens after we know the tax rate? After we know the tax rate, we can print it out. We can say print tax rate, and then, then we can calculate the tax bill. Tax bill is tax rate times income, then we can print the tax bill. All right, so let's start to write some code. So I already have dependents figured out, so I got this part figured out. Now let's do annual income, this is pretty easy. Income, and I want it to be a float, right? Enter your annual income, that's pretty good. Now I'm down into this part. So I need to say if dependence is equal to zero. So in Python, that is if two equals. And the way it works in Python is use this colon. This colon symbol means that you're starting a block of code underneath the if. Everything that's indented from after this colon belongs part of this if. So that means it only executes when this condition, this Boolean expression right here, is true. And what do we want to do? We want to say tax rate 0.3. When you're doing this in, in Python, else if has a special keyword, E-L-I-F. You cannot do else if like that in Python. It won't do what you expect. You want to use elif like this. I could try, I guess I could try it that way and see what happens. All right, that looks pretty good. Now let's just try this. Let's say print tax rate. And just to see what happens here, I'm gonna run that. And you can see I have an error, syntax error here, else if, showing you that you cannot do it this way. You have to use elif. Now there's probably a way that I could do it. It's not 100% true. I could do this, else, colon, enter, if, enter, else, colon if else I could do that I think that'll probably work but that looks really ugly and messy let me see if that does work two dependents oh I got rid of the print didn't I let's do it down here zero one eight which is the right tax rate for two dependents but this looks really ugly and messy, this if and then else and then if and then else. And so this is why the elif structure exists. It sort of simplifies the way that your Python looks. Let me get this indented the right way. By the way, when I'm getting this, these things moved over, I'm using a key on the keyboard called the tab key. So tab and then shift tab goes the other way. Tab, shift tab, tab. That's very useful. If you don't have things lined up right, doesn't work well in Python. See that? It's red because it's not falling under an indent. So you want to tab it over like that. Let's make this a little more friendly. Let's say print your tax rate. And then let's print it out with a format code. There we go. Now let's calculate our tax bill. Tax bill, not bull mic, bill is going to be the tax rate times the income. Then we'll print that out, tax bill. 
that went out once again out to two decimal places just for the heck of it. All right, let's see what we got now. I'm gonna run it. Let's put in one dependent. Enter your income. Twenty-five percent. Two hundred and fifty dollars seems to work. Where you would go wrong as a programmer is if you just tested it once like this and assumed it was going to work. You have to think about your code and what it does and all of the different possible in inputs that you should check before you can really kind of make an assumption that what you did works. I'll give you an example of that. So we're making a decision here, a single decision about dependence, but we have one, two, three, four different things that could happen with that decision. So you, one can argue that this program can't really be tested unless I actually try one, two, three, four different inputs for dependents. So let me do that. I run it, number of dependents zero, $100. Okay, $30, that makes sense. Run it again. Number of dependents one, $100. $25 tax bill, still looks right. Let's run it again. Two. $18 tax bill, looks good. The last one should be a $10 tax bill. Ooh, it's a it's a $1,000 tax bill? All right, so this number of dependents three didn't work, so I better look through my code here. Dependents two, else means else, if you want to think about it, it's three or more, right? Oh, it says tax rate 10, it should be point 10, right? All right, so I missed a decimal point. That, would explain it. Number of dependents, let's try four. Tax bill is $10, looks good. All right, so we per pretty much have it figured out at this point, the problem is solved. A couple of things we haven't done, and you should always consider doing these things to make your program better, is if I run this program and I put in number of dependents that, uh, it blows up, right? It gives me a value error, that's not very friendly. Imagine if you made a mobile app that did this and someone just put in something like that and then the mobile app crashed, that, that wouldn't be acceptable, right? So it shouldn't be acceptable in the programs we write in Jupyter Notebook either, especially if we want other people to use them. If they're for ourselves, that's one thing, but if you're writing a program that someone else is going to use, you wanna make sure it has as much polish on it as possible. And that polish comes in the form of sanitizing your inputs. The other thing that we need to handle is if I run this again and I put in a number of dependents of negative 100, right? And then I put in an annual income of 100, it says my tax bill is 10%, it probably, or 10% for my tax rate, and my tax bill is $100. Shouldn't say that. It should say that's not an acceptable number of dependents or something. All right, so let's handle these things. Let's handle the first case. So let's do this. Let's say up here, we're gonna add another decision. So in our if, we have if, else if, else if, and then we have else, let's put another else if in here. E-L-I-F, dependents, less than zero, print, not, a valid number of dependent. And you might think, hey, that's pretty cool, right? That probably does what I want. Let's see if that works, right? The number of dependents, negative 50. Annual income, 1,000. Not a valid number of dependents, but then it still goes ahead and calculates my tax rate and tax bill. It's still doing all this down here. And you can see how fundamentally that's not what we wanted to have happen. And as a result, this, this decision here is not what we want. So if we think about this, I'm gonna get rid of what I just put in here and I'm, I'm just gonna think about this some more. So I want this to go, I want this to go, and none of this should happen if I enter an invalid number of dependents, right? None of the stuff I highlighted here should happen if I don't enter a valid number of dependents. So what I need is another decision. So I'm gonna say if dependents is bigger than or equal to zero, I want to do all this. Else, and, uh, and this else, we're talking about less than zero. I guess I could put it in there. Dependence less than zero. Let's print out invalid number of dependents. Let's give that a shot. Enter number of dependents, negative 10. Enter your income, 100. Invalid number of dependents. So there you go. So because I put this if up here, when this is not true, it comes down to this else. 
and it skips all of this, which is exactly what we wanted because we don't want to calculate tax rates and tax bills on an invalid number of dependents. All right, so that makes more sense. So now the next thing we need to do is we need to handle these two inputs when we type in something that isn't an integer and isn't a float and we get a value error. Let's run it again to show you. So I put in this for the number of dependents and I get a value error. These are called runtime errors because the error occurs when you execute the program. To handle a runtime error, you use try except. So the general syntax is try, right? And then a bunch of stuff you want to try, which is I want to try all this. I want to try my whole program. And then when something goes wrong, which it's going to go wrong here or here, I want to have an accept. And what kind of error do I get? It's a value error. It's right here. I'm going to copy it because I'm lazy. Accept value error. What am I going to do when I get that value error? I am going to print invalid input. How's that? We'll just keep it real simple. I'm going to run it now. Put in something like that. And it just says invalid input. See, I don't get any error. It doesn't blow up. I'm going to get rid of this cell here. It doesn't blow up, it just gives me an error, a nice graceful error message and then ends the program. I could be more graceful here and say, I'm sorry, I couldn't calculate your taxes because you couldn't follow the directions. I could say that. All right, enter number of dependents, negative one, enter your income, and valid number of dependents. That works. Let me run it again. Enter number of dependents one, enter your annual, annual income, invalid input. I might want to say invalid input program quitting. Now, if this was an a, a mobile application, right, this would be a form or a screen and you'd fill it out. So you wouldn't have to really handle it, write the program to work this way. You would use something called an event driven model where this code that you see right here really wouldn't execute until it knew it had the right inputs to begin with. That's a little different and we might get to that later on. But for now, this is sort of how you would code up something that would be linear with its inputs where it asks you to type in one input, then asks you to type in the other input and then processes the data based on that and displays output. So to conclude, one other thing that you might be thinking is why not put the a try except up here like this? I could take this, right? I'm just gonna try these. And when I get an exception, print, right? And you might put this back over there like that. Well, when you do it this way, when the exception occurs, it does this, and then it continues on and, and continues with this code, right? Let me just demonstrate quickly. I'm gonna run it, enter number dependence, blah. And then it keeps running the program anyway, which is not what we want, right? We don't want any of this stuff to run if I don't have good values for these. Therefore, it's important to structure your try except in a way that not only are these things in the try block, but the code that depends on those variables are also in the try block. That is how you properly code up a try except block. Okay, thanks for watching. Hopefully you learned a lot and we'll see you for the next one. Bye now.